Hi Nolan, thanks for coming to talk to us today about your new book Nihilism and Technology. I wanted if you could introduce yourself a bit and tell us more about the book. Yes, thanks. Uh, Nolan Gertz, uh, Assistant Professor of Applied Philosophy at the University of Twente uh, in the Netherlands. I'm originally from the United States. Um, the book uh, is pretty much the result of my time in both countries. Uh, the United States and Netherlands are both very technological. Uh, the University of Twente is certainly very uh, tech-focused. The uh, motto is high-tech human touch, uh, which was certainly something I've, I've uh, spent a lot of time trying to think about what that means. Um, and I think more and more, if you see uh, debates around technology, you see people talking about, uh, is technology good or bad? And I wanted to sort of explore um, a different dimension and think more about not what technology is doing to us, but what we're doing to technology. Um, so that opens up really more of a philosophical perspective on what it means to be human and then what it means to be human when using technology. Mm. And why did you choose Nietzsche's philosophy in particular to analyze technology? Right. Um, that's a good question. I think um, as much as students uh, constantly demand the newest philosophy, the newest philosophy, uh, get very aggravated when I assign readings that are 10 years old. Uh, it certainly looks odd to go back to the 19th century to understand 21st. Um, but what's good about Nietzsche is that I think, um, I mean, on the one hand, he himself constantly joked, uh, well, maybe he wasn't joking, um, <laughs> that his readers haven't been born yet and that he was writing for the future. Mm. And even though he didn't really describe um, technology that much in his writing, he was focused specifically on uh, what he described as sort of cultural diseases and sort of saw himself as a, a cultural physician. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to look at technology in sort of a similar fashion uh, in how it can be understood uh, and how nihilism can be understood um, as more cultural phenomena, which again is why it can't just be a good-bad, because uh, it's not a merely individual issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, speaking about frameworks, um, could you tell us a bit more about the post-phenomenological framework that you use in the book? Right. So post-phenomenology um, starts from uh, Don Eide at uh, SUNY Stony Brook. Um, he's influenced by Heidegger, um, and he's got sort of um, Heidegger's descriptions of technologies, um, but at the same time, he has Heidegger's uh, attack on technology. Um, and there's sort of this, this contradictory uh, way of thinking in Heidegger about technology that um, ID is trying to figure out how to basically rip the descriptions, rip the framework, rip the analyses out of um, Heidegger's big picture way of thinking about technology uh, with this question about being and instead look more at everyday life, which is again uh, what attracted me to Nietzsche um, and Heidegger is following uh, Nietzsche the sort of analyses of everyday life and bringing philosophy to bear on understanding everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, in the book you um, examine lots of different technological phenomena such as Twitter, Fitbit, Netflix, um, but I wanted in chapter 6 you explore how racial discrimination through the selection of guests in Airbnb um, embodies the nihilistic will for power. Do you think that tech companies have a responsibility to manage their users' choices and prevent this discrimination in, it, in any way? Right. And this was something um, I looked at um, in this sort of this hashtag movement, Airbnb while black, and an op-ed um, written by someone who was... Um, uh, who had experienced this herself and this sort of idea that um, there are lots of things the company could be doing uh, kicking off uh, anyone who uh, was clearly using uh, racial discrimination and picking potential uh, guests. Mm -hmm. But I, what I was more interested in, and this is really where the issue with um, Uber, uh, Lyft, and Flywheel uh, claim, came in, because Uber, Lyft, and Flywheel are all uh, similar in um, car share apps. But what's interesting is um, they present to the, uh, the driver um, information about the pickup at different points in the pickup. Mm -hmm. So um, it seemed the earlier you got a profile photo and the earlier you got a name, uh, the greater the likelihood you had of discriminating. Mm -hmm. So what was interesting was um, 
what I'm interested in specifically is not so much uh, how do we police racists using apps, mm -hmm. but more about how the apps themselves uh, shape discriminatory practices. Mm -hmm. And then it's not so much about can the company police user behavior, mm -hmm. but can the company understand its own role in that behavior. Mm -hmm. And in reference to data-driven um, nihilism and the embracing of unknowable al algorithms, you say in the book, the question is not whether we can understand and regulate algorithms, but whether we can understand and regulate nihilism. Um, could you tell me a bit more about this and whether you think it's achievable to regulate nihilism? Right. So the, the issue with algorithms seemed to be, and you saw this recently in Zuckerberg's uh, congressional testimony, this idea of uh, sure, Facebook has a lot of problems, but they can be solved by artificial intelligence. So we just need, um, the only way to stop a bad app is a good app. So um, AI will solve everything. Um, and what was interesting in the research is that on the one hand, because it's called artificial intelligence, um, and we often use terms like smart technology, um, people automatically think AI must be really smart. Um, and that's, that's actually not true. Um, it's really dumb. Um, it's, it's simply uh, automated rule following. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, um, we sort of have a faith in artificial intelligence, which again, which was shown in Zuckerberg's testimony. And it was that faith specifically that I was interested in. And that idea that, um, again, like how Nietzsche thinks about faith, there is something about um, our willingness to believe uh, someone has the answer. And the greater the mystery, um, the greater the faith we put into it. Mm -hmm. So it seemed kind of important that artificial intelligence is very mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, even the engineers who write the code can't actually look into the code and explain why an answer comes up. Mm -hmm. So if you watch um, uh, that famous uh, Jeopardy challenge with, uh, uh, what was it, Deep Blue? Uh, taking on Ken Jennings and the other Jeopardy challenge. And it was, you know, destroying them, you know, 30,000 to negative whatever. Um, but occasionally it would say something uh, completely odd. Mm -hmm. And it's these odd moments that give people pause because that could be then in the medical field. Uh, the diagnosis you get is that odd moment. And no one knows why it just said Toronto when it was clearly a mathematical question. Mm -hmm. um, and it's again that sort of the mystery uh, inspires the faith. Mm -hmm. So it's again pointing back to what it is about us that leads us down that path in the first place and not so much about AI itself. Mm -hmm. um, one of your proposed solutions to um, humans, problems that humans face with technology is bringing um, back together freedom and um, responsibility. Um, how do you think this should be achieved? Yeah, so this is something um, existential philosophers are uh, perhaps most well known for. This sort of idea, uh, we like talking a lot about freedom. We're clearly obsessed with the idea of freedom. Uh, Brexit and Trump seem to be very much about uh, the need for greater freedom, uh, take back control. Um, but when people understand that the flip side of freedom is responsibility, um, then you start asking for freedom from freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and you saw this again in, in Brexit votes and Trump votes, this idea of, um, especially in Brexit, um, that I think the number one Google search the day after was, what is Brexit? Mm -hmm. um, so this idea that you could vote for something just to sort of see, you know, am I sending a message? And this was something, again, with Trump, I'm just sending a message. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Hillary's going to win, so I'm just sending a message. Mm -hmm. um, but if enough people do that, then there's your answer. Um, so it's this idea of uh, how to uh, confront, on the one hand, um, the desire for freedom without responsibility. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what it really means to be free as being responsible. Um, and this is something that I think technology uh, can help us to sort of see how dangerous we can really get. Um, in the 50s, this was something a lot of uh, philosophers were interested in after uh, the rise of fascism, uh, studying why people were so quick to embrace fascism. Mm -hmm. And what specifically is you have this sort of Mussolini idea, um, 
you know, people don't question things as long as the trains run on time. Mm -hmm. And you can see that, uh, so the technology is helpful in mediating people's desire for fascism, because if the trains are running on time, then I don't really pay attention to what's going on around me. Uh, Sartre writes an essay about this called uh, Paris Under the Occupation. And this idea that uh, living under Nazi ruled France, you kind of get used to it. Um, and it's again that trains running on time idea. So technology can be very helpful if you want to be a fascist. Um, I'm not giving pointers, um, but it can be very helpful in, in getting people used to it, in what's called normalizing fascism. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people think it's a, it's a tool for democracy, so it should be the, the best way to fight it. Um, and that's why it's so fascinating to see something like Twitter, um, which is supposed to be a democratic open space being weaponized by someone like Trump. Um, so we really do need to take seriously the role that technologies play uh, in both fascism and democracy and freedom and responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing that's come up since um, your book was written is the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the misuse of Facebook data. Um, and in the context of your work and our discussion, how would you analyse these events? And do you think that the public outrage is a reaction to the breaking of an illusion or um, are they forced to face an analytic reality? Yeah, so Facebook, uh, I was very intrigued by uh, Zuckerberg's testimony because um, you saw a lot of people afterwards and beforehand talking about regulation, regulation, regulation. And Zuckerberg was very quick to say, yes, please regulate us. Um, but what I was interested in was um, the way he framed what Facebook is. Um, and nobody, as far as I saw, really pushed back against this. Because he keeps saying repeatedly in the testimony, um, Facebook is a tool. Yeah. We build tools. And the idea then that, um, and this is very important for Heidegger, the idea of viewing technology as, as neutral. And you get this idea, uh, certainly popular in the US with gun control debates. Um, technology is neutral, so it's only bad if bad people use it, and it's good if good people use it. So clearly all we need to do, uh, we don't need gun control, we just need mental health measures because we need to keep bad people from using guns. And the best way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Um, and you could see that Facebook, uh, Facebook Zuckerberg, uh, in describing Facebook, was sort of uh, mimicking these forms of arguments. Um, and that's, again, why the only way to stop someone uh, bad, like Cambridge Analytica, misusing Facebook, is someone good, like AI, using uh, Facebook. But what I wanted to look at was specifically the idea of, of looking at uh, the neutral thesis um, of what it means to view technology this way, to take it for granted that technology is a neutral medium, rather than, as I suggested, that it's shaping. So again, uh, specifically with Cambridge Analytica, we get, um, it's very easy to say, is Facebook violating our privacy, yes or no? How do we regulate our privacy, things like the GDPR? But what I'm interested in, and uh, what post-phenomenology is good for, is rather understanding how Facebook redefines what privacy means. Um, and this is the kind of thing that philosophy of technology is really, um, I think, necessary for these political debates. Mm. And given your fascinating analysis of um, these different facets of technology, would you class yourself as a techno-optimist or a techno-pessimist? Right. Um, well, one of the inspirations for the book was clearly my son, uh, who I describe in the preface as being a little too into technology. Um, it's sort of helping me to see how much maybe I'm a little too into technology. Um, so in my, in my lectures, I am a techno-pessimist, um, but then outside, I'm, uh, you know, I have my phone, I'm using technology to teach, um, I have various social media accounts. Um, so it seems much more, uh, maybe a techno-hypocrite would be the better, uh, which is again a, a, a why I say very early on I'm a nihilist. Um, I use um, something which I know anyone philosophically trained is, is prepared to attack me on. I use, I use the word we in the book a lot. Um, but that was part of the thinking, was that I'm, I'm not uh, separating myself from this, so they is clearly inappropriate. Uh, but it's also, I don't think, just me, so I seems inappropriate. Um, and when you say something like users, um, that again sounds like far too limited. 
um, so I take pronouns very seriously, and I think uh, you know if people want to opt out of my we, you know, go go right ahead. Um, but I, I do think it's important um, whether you're a techno optimist or a techno pessimist to really think about um, the degree to which technology frames who and what you are, such that you think you have to use uh, a prefix like techno in your self description anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And finally, what do you see as a future for humans' relationship with technology? Right. Well, it's certainly nice to imagine us having a future. Um, so that's, that's comforting to think that we'll still be here. Um, but I, I, I can imagine um, as something like transhumanism becomes more and more popular, um, as self-driving cars, as Internet of Things, as smart technologies in general uh, become more and more popular, um, what will be the greatest concern is, is uh, the ubiquity of technology. Mm -hmm. um, that it's just there and it's in everything. Mm -hmm. um, so your refrigerator has its own social media account and you have to then be concerned about is Facebook spying on your eggs. Um, and I think that that's kind of where we're going to go is, and this is where we've already been, so it's likely this will just keep happening. Um, tech companies offer something great, uh, we think only about the benefits, then we discover the costs, then we push back, and then we go forward again. Um, and yet what's fascinating, um, I wrote an article about this a few years ago, is that if you trace Facebook's evolution, um, it's never affected their stocks. So even when Zuckerberg's doing the testimony, he's making billions of dollars, and people were, were tracking his stocks, so he was making money by testifying. Um, which is probably why he'll run for president. So maybe that's really the future, is that we'll just have a full uh, technocratic state, and that will be the, 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 the future. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much for coming to speak to us today. That's interesting.